body of death. As much as we might try, we know we are helpless to save ourselves. Though we pile up good works and good intentions, we can never measure up and never wash away the stain of our sins. But Zephaniah also reminds us that our God, the one true living God, is mighty to save. He has taken away our punishment in Jesus. He is with us through his spirit. He delights in us. There is truly no one like our God.
want to share with you this morning. And no, this was not planned to give Pat a cover time to run into this table. That wasn't it. But it sure works, doesn't it? It works really well. Um, by the way, I'm kind of glad he forgot his table. Because it sounded beautiful from the front to listen to us sing that way. Um, that was a great opportunity for us to do that. All right, let me share a few things with you uh, before we continue our time of worship. Uh, first thing I wanted to let you know about um, Epic, which is the Young Couples Adult Bible Fellowship class, is restarted on January 6th. Uh, the group is going to be meeting in the library up here, and uh, if you would like more information about this Young Couples group, would like to be part of it, you can speak with me, you can talk with Pat um, about how to get involved, but pretty much all you have to do is show up. So uh, we'd love to see you there. We're looking forward to that. Also want to let you know that we are still taking sign-ups for both the Ladies' Tuesday Evening Bible Study and for the Men's Bible Study. They're both kicking off in the new year. We have sign-up sheets in the back for both of those, and we just want to encourage you again to get involved. If you're not a part of a Bible study right now, or if you're not um, engaged in some sort of group, we invite you to be part of that. Get involved, get engaged, sign up for one of those, and you can look in your bulletin for more information about who to talk to or for more information on those things. Uh, finally, if you reach into your bulletin and pull out this red sheet of paper, we are bringing back the Computer Security Seminar and Fundraiser. Uh, and that we're bringing that back actually by popular demand. Our own Matt Gilmore, who is our tech expert, resident tech expert, has gotten a number of requests from folks to to have that seminar again, both from people who weren't able to make it the first time and from folks who made it the first time but want a refresher on that material. So what we are doing is we are holding it again on January 19th. It's going to be from 9 a.m. to noon, and it will be down in the Fellowship Hall. Here's the good news, friends. If, if you already gave a donation to the Technology Fund at the last time and you want to come back for the second show, don't feel like you have to give another donation to show up. But the, the thing that uh, Matt wants to do with this as well is to make this a fundraiser for technology here at Bethel. We are making investments in uh, trying to upgrade the stuff that we've got here, and uh, uh, we're already making those right now. Um, it, it is a big need here, so I'm thankful for Matt for his willingness to share his expertise with us and for this opportunity for you. Now I want to take some time as we continue on in our worship just for a time of prayer. So would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray together this morning. Father, we just come before you thankful. This is a season of gratitude that we have. And there are so many things for us to be thankful for. This morning I think of our church and our church family. I'm so thankful for Bethel. I'm thankful for the many families that call this place their church home. For so many people who have been coming to visit, Lord. Thank you for this place where we can connect and, and hear your truth and, and just enjoy fellowship with one another. Lord, we thank you as well for our families and our friends, and this is a time of year that you use to draw us together, to be able to just enjoy our time with them, connect with them, appreciate them, let them know just how meaningful they are to us. And Father, there are so many ways that you bless us. This is a time of year where we're able to count those blessings. We're able to think about all the many ways in which you love us in very tangible ways. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. And yet, God, in the midst of all these things, the thing that we are most thankful for, what we are most thankful for this morning, is for Jesus. Father, we're right on the cusp here of Christmas, where we remember the fact that you sent your Son into the world. And we remember the fact that he 
God, would you continue to be with us as we seek you in worship, as we seek to express our praise and our thankfulness to you. Would you speak to us? Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord.
6 and 7. Hear the word of the Lord. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 33. Hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Revelation 7, 17. Hear the word of the Lord. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Would you bow your heads with me for just a minute and pray? Father, we thank you for these words that are from you. They are words of love for your people, and we are your people. They explain just how much you want to care for us and take care of us. at the city 
and then by night they can sit back in their tents and eat a good meal, get a good night's rest, while the people in the city struggle with starvation and not having enough to drink. Siege warfare was terrible. But what makes this news from Micah about Jerusalem even more frightening for the people who are hearing this for the first time is that if Jerusalem was under siege, what it meant was, more than likely, all the rest of Judah had already been conquered. That would mean that, that people who were living out in the countryside around Jerusalem, probably people who the people living in Jerusalem knew, maybe family members, maybe friends, had either been killed or conscripted into the enemy's army or even sent off into exile to some far and distant land. And so Jerusalem would have been the last city standing between the enemy and total conquest of Judah. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody living in the city at that period of time, if you can. Close your eyes if it helps you imagine. But what would it be like? How would you feel to live in constant fear for your life? What would it be like to try to survive objects being hurled at you by day and then at, during the night trying to struggle to find something to eat or to drink? What would it be like knowing that all the rest of your nation has fallen. That among them were friends and family members who, who may have died by the sword or been carried off to some far and distant land. And what would it be like to be trapped inside a city like that where you knew that your enemy was waiting outside the walls for you to either die on the inside or to uh, get so desperate that you'd be willing to walk outside those walls. If you were in that situation, what would you want most? What would you be wishing for, hoping for? Would you want some kind of powerful weapon that would enable you to try to defeat that enemy with, uh, that was around you? Would you maybe set your sights a little lower and just wish for a warm meal to fill your stomach? I know what I would wish if I was in that position. What I want is peace. I want that enemy that was outside of those walls to pack up its things and head back to wherever it came from. I want to have that daily barrage of, of objects being thrown at this city to stop. <coughs> I'd want to stop worrying about whether today or tomorrow was going to be my last day. I would want peace. And peace is precisely what God was promising his people. But God didn't promise just any kind of peace. He promised a peace that was going to come through a new ruler. And oddly enough, that new ruler was going to have an ancient pedigree. When Micah mentions that this ruler is going to come from the town Bethlehem, Ephratha, the people who originally heard this message from him would have known exactly what he was talking about, and they would have been excited. Because Bethlehem, <laughs> Bethlehem was the birthplace of David. And when David was king, well, those were the good old days for the nation. Because David ruled a united kingdom. And on top of that, he defeated Israel's enemies regularly. And my guess is that when Micah got to that point, when he explained that this new ruler was going to come from Bethlehem, the people stopped listening. Really? We're going to get a new ruler? And he's going to be from Bethlehem. He's going to be in the line of David, huh? That's fantastic. My guess is they start clapping their hands and planning for the day which Israel would be on top, would be the top nation in the region again. 
when they wouldn't have to fear any enemy. And they would have been woefully God about, uh, woefully wrong about what God was doing. Because they were focused on a peace that simply meant the end of armed conflict for them. What they really wanted was that invading troop to go away. But those invading troops really weren't the cause of their problems at all. The people were the ones who had caused their problems. As we've gone through Michael, we see that the people had insisted on doing something completely different than what God had asked them to do. They were the ones who had chosen to chase after false and foreign gods. They were the ones who had chosen to pursue greed. They were the ones who had forgotten to care about each other and especially about those who had difficulty caring for themselves. They had forgotten their covenant with God. So, how was the end of this war going to fix their heart problems? How was sending this enemy army away going to somehow solve the issues that they had with God? Now, it was completely true that the ruler that God was going to send was going to come from David's bloodline. But when we read further in this passage, we see that this ruler was going to be different from David. Micah wrote that this new ruler would shepherd his flock. This was a ruler who was going to be gentle and caring with people. Mike also said that this new ruler would rule in the strength of the Lord. In other words, this ruler wasn't going to rule through his own power or his own ability. Instead, his success was going to come through his submission and obedience to God. Micah added that this new ruler would rule in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. This ruler would actually rule with the authority of God himself. And it was going to take this kind of ruler, a special ruler, to bring about the peace that God was wanting to give the people. Because God's peace is about more than just freedom from armed conflict. God's peace, shalom, is about wholeness. It's about being complete. It's about being healed. It's about being renewed. You see, God knows, and I, I think we all do, down deep, that the enemy that can encamp around us is not our biggest problem. It's the sin that lives inside of us. And while a military leader might help us ward off some enemy army, how is a military leader going to save us from ourselves? But God promised people shalom, a peace greater than the people desired, and he promised a leader who would bring healing and hope and wholeness and who would bridge the gap that we created that divided us from God. The amazing news from this passage is that God's promise for the people of Judah of so long ago is his promise to us today. God desires to give us peace. And even more, the ruler that God promised, the one who's going to set everything right, he's come. Listen to what Luke writes in his gospel. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. 
I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then a whole host of angels began to sing, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. God has kept his promise. And the peace that you and I so desperately need is ours in Jesus Christ. And tomorrow night, we are going to celebrate God keeping his promise by sending that ruler who is the greatest gift that the world has ever known. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you for your promise. God, you are so good that you sent Jesus, your only son, to save us to save us from ourselves, not from an attacking army, but from the sin that lives inside of us. What an amazing thing it is that you have done. And truly, there is no God that can compare to you. Father, may we live these next days, this next week, this next year, in light of what it is that you have done for us, this awesome, wonderful day. Lord, continue with us this day. Be with us and bless us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I let you go this morning, I want to remind you that tomorrow night is our Christmas Eve service, and it will begin at 7 o'clock. You can come earlier. I think we're going to have just a very brief prelude to that service, but uh, would love to have you here. Also, want to let you know, there's still time to use to invite somebody. Maybe you can't drop it in the mail, but we've got some extras back on the information table. If you wanted to run next door and invite your neighbor or somebody else like that, please grab one, five, ten of them, however many that you need, and invite somebody that you know might not be going to church someplace Christmas Eve. Invite them to come here and celebrate Christmas Eve with us. It's been wonderful being with you here this morning. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.